So, Busher, the content train rolls on here at True Footy. We have some good news. Do we? Yes, our sponsor Manscaped has extended for another couple of months with us. They've seen what we've been cooking here at True Footy HQ and they want to jump on board. Who is Manscaped, you ask? Manscaped is the global leader in manscaping and male grooming products and they're dedicated to help you level up your full body grooming routine. You'll be happy to hear they forever changed the male grooming game with the Perfect Package 3.0. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit does come with the essential lawnmower 3.0, which is a water proof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to keep your grooming routine on point. This is the best trimmer in the market for those of you in need of a chest shave. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to the advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. Inside this perfect package you'll also find the Manscaped crop preserver which is a ball deodorant and anti-chafing ball deodorant at that. And it's also a moisturizer to really help with chafing situations down below. That would have been perfect on the Benny's dance floor the other night. You'll also find the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. A testy toner that's designed to give you a pep in your step. I can't wait to have lovely toned balls. You can immediately by subscribing to the perfect package and get a new blade refill for your lawnmower 3.0 delivered to your door every three months. For a limited time, subscribers get two three gifts. A shed travel bag and the patented high performance manscaping boxes. So please take the time to check out our sponsors Manscaped Com, and with the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word, you actually get 20% off all these elite products in addition to the offers that we just read, and you get free shipping as well. So it's an absolute no-brainer. 20%? That's <laughs> almost a quarter. So one more time, guys, manscaped.com, TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word, you get 20% off and free shipping, which is an absolute bargain. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the podcast. All right, welcome back to Footy Podcast 73, joined once again by Bush Daddy 3000. How are you? Almost as good as Andre 3000. <laughs> yeah, not quite yeah. as talented, but <laughs> not quite there. there. We're working on it. And uh, the big Lorenzo Fogliani. Well, thanks for having me back again. By popular demand. Oh, uh, thank, thanks for having me again. Yeah, no, it's good to see you, man. Um, it was we... also good to see you the other night at Benny Harness. Oh, <laughs> mate, it was fantastic. Just a few uh, apple juices with the boys. It was beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good fun. Good fun. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously you weren't part of the last potty because we did it on a Saturday when you have footballing commitments because yep. uh, you're actually involved in the football sector, yep. not like us. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's good to have you back for uh, today. Yep. Um, yeah, haven't seen you since the preseason predictions podcast. So I guess first up, um, before we get into like we have some questions, Fresh questions. Discord yep. and stuff like that, I guess what have you made of the season so far in terms of the standard and yep. the entertainingness of it? Oh, I love it. Um, it's really... Oh, like where everyone's probably going to say it's free flowing. Mm. Um, the big forwards are back in vogue. Um, obviously, the big ones, Tex. You know, yeah. I, thought, I thought he was washed up, was going to struggle to even kick 10 goals this year. And look, he, the way he's kicking them, he might kick 100 this year, the way mm. he's going, which would just be a fantastic story. Um, some teams that I thought weren't going to be real competitive this year have really um, flown up the ladder. You know, Adelaide and Sydney. Um, and I know these guys haven't won that many games, but I really like the look of Essendon as mm. well this year. Um, so all in all, I think it's been a great start to the year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think if you told me like at the start of the year that Tex Walker would be a shout for 100 goals in a season, I'd say that would be up there with the biggest sporting <laughs> shocks along with yeah. Leicester City winning the, the Premier League in 2016. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, it's just baffling. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the effect of obviously some new rules has, has had on big key forwards kicking yeah. goals. And there's been, there's been instances where key defenders have had good games and their opponents yeah. kicked four or five goals like Darcy yeah. Moore against um, oh, who was it a couple of weeks ago Collingwood played uh, was it Mackay was it, who didn't Mac Mackay yeah, went off against Freo yeah no but I think Mac yes it was um, Mackay kicked Moore. four yes. and Moore but Moore was probably the best player on the ground yeah that, that's, that was what I was trying to highlight exactly right so yeah it's, uh, it's a weird dynamic now and we're seeing like young key forwards as well get their there are opportunities to get their hands on the pill more, like Max yeah. King on the weekend yeah. kick five goals, which is great to see because you don't want to think like uh, key four is like a dying breed in the yeah. AFL. They're, they're becoming more prominent um, as ever. And as you touched on as well, it's like some of these teams are so hard to get a read on because um, like someone like an Essendon has just been up and then down and then, yeah. or actually they've been down and then up um, yeah. and then other teams have been up and down as well. But yeah, um, is there any team, I guess, um, we talk about Taylor Walker as a player, but any teams in particular that uh, have really shocked you so far? Um, well, at the moment, I would say my favourite team to watch is Sydney. Yeah, um, you know, I've I think said the it, same thing. I think in Other than Freo, but... I yeah. think in years gone by, you probably would have just seen Sydney being that dour, defensive, 
it was always a slog whereas now they're just playing really exciting footy mm. um their kids are exciting the veterans are playing well um and look with their history and the bloods culture like it wouldn't surprise me if they're genuinely having a crack at the flag this year yeah i tend to agree with you um i forgot as i said that at sydney the clear answer for the most shocking team is that is that yeah. something you would uh, echo as well definitely do you reckon they're the real deal me tough to say just yeah like they probably need a few more runs on the board concerning their youth and all that sort of stuff but they're on track to be legitimate i think with their history of being a club and the bloods culture i think that's what probably separates them from another team that might have been similar to them in development yes so i think that's probably why i'm i wouldn't be as surprised if they've made the grand final this mm. year or did you know a um bulldogs in 2016 yeah. ironically against sydney <laughs> but yeah like just because of their history the way their club's been managed and coached um yeah i think they can do a bit of damage this year Ironically as well, the Bulldogs are probably the other big contender at the yeah. moment. Uh, so it could be another Sydney Bulldogs game for as it currently stands. Uh, yeah, uh, Sydney have been a joy to watch it. Like, I think uh, Jared Healy was saying it's amazing to see how a coach's con- like game plan and philosophy is backflipped yeah. in the same way that someone like John Longmire, who's had a career, yeah. uh, such a successful career as a, a, you know, a pretty sort of defensive like game style, not very yeah. attacking and free-flowing, and now... Yeah. Yeah, it's gone the ex- exact opposite way. I think, as well, maybe this generation and this crop of talent has a bit more skill than previous yeah. generations. I, I think don't know. Don Pike going there as a senior assistant coach probably yeah. helps because oh, when he coached Adelaide in 2017, they were a very fast attacking team. And, you know, sometimes you just do need that other person that's had a similar experience to you, been very good at their craft, and he comes in and can also mentor in that department. Because um, they. Even though Sydney are still much more attacking now, they're still defensively sound. Mm. Like, I think Rampy's still been good. Lloyd's been good. Um, Tommy McCartan, I think, has taken his game to another level. So, yes, they've been brilliantly offensively, but they've still maintained their defensive standards. Very true. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have uh, a lot of questions today that we'll go through across the league in general. Um, yep. And I've couple of, kind of chucked a couple of my own in there just to yep. sort of keep talking about, you yep. know, the, the relevance of the league. But... Um, First one that's probably a hot topic right now this week, yeah. um, and every it does change week to week which coach is under the most pressure, yeah. but uh, this week it's Nathan Buckley and Collingwood obviously coming off yeah. the back of uh, the Pies going down by five goals to GWS, yeah. and uh, GWS pre- prior to that was the L- hot Leon talk about. Cameron. Exactly <laughs> right. Pressure, so. Yeah, exactly right. So um, a couple of interesting things that come up uh, from this game for me is, uh, other than the Pies now sitting one and three, they were the second oldest team in the league last round. Yeah. And GWS were the youngest. Yeah. Which in itself surprised me because I didn't know... Yeah. I know GWS have had a lot of your kids come in, a bit of an exodus there. But uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty stark and to go down by five goals, um, it's, it's yeah. an indictment. So yeah. I guess I'll ask this both to you, both of you. Um, I guess Bush, you can answer mm-hmm. first. Do you think Nathan Buckley will be coach at the end of the year, bearing in mind he's out of contract? I think it could be an issue, because especially because I've read in some of the Collingwood fans' complaints about him. like They sort of think he's not blooding enough kids, like not giving the kids enough opportunity. And the way they've sort of built their list the past few years, they've brought in a fair few of those kids, so mm-hmm. you need to give them the opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Like, and he's still sort of going with some old stalwarts, sort of mm. playing some guys in different positions. A bit stale, you reckon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a fair argument. What about he, yourself, Lee? He sounds mentally tired. Mm. Um, you know, you don't know what the hub life has done to him. You don't know what last year's trade period. Well, did he didn't to him. chose choose the hub life. The hub life chose him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, um, and <laughs> due to circumstances, and he wasn't the only coach to suffer from yeah, that. Yeah. But you know, when he's had the hub life, the trade period fiasco, it almost starts becoming if he really wants it. And I think at the start of the year, he said he wouldn't mind moving on for the betterment yeah. of the team. I think that's what he said. So it's almost like then now the player's going, is he fully invested in us or is he a bit distant from us? So, look, he's, you don't want to put words into people's mouths, but maybe it is time for him just to step back a little bit and maybe just let someone else take over. Even the still- allegations that like guys like Trelaw and Stevenson made about some of the shit he told him in that off-season period, sort of like yeah. the other rest of the guys who still are on the team would be like, if he talked to those guys like that when they were a part of the team, how's he going to treat me? Yeah. There might be a bit of that as well. Very true. If you take what Trelaw said on face value, it's pretty cooked to think that like someone would say that to a player like yeah, the playing exactly. group don't want you to stick around so yeah, yeah he's under pressure I think you make an interesting point there about being mentally tired yeah I, I watched that as well Buckley basically said um, 
it almost sounded like he could take it or leave it, whether yeah. if Collingwood felt he was the best man for the job, then sure. But if they feel like it's not the right thing yeah. for him to uh, to be there, then uh, he would happily stand back. And the, yeah, it just sounded like a, yeah. a coach that wasn't really maybe emotionally committed to I've it. I've got another potential criteria as well. Is like He was always Eddie Maguire's boy, like... Yeah. He would have been yeah. under more pressure previously as a coach, like cause especially those early years, like when they first fired Malthouse and he didn't look that good as a coach. Yeah. Now that they've had a few finals runs, he's sort of been validated a little bit. Yeah. But still, if it wasn't for Eddie Maguire protecting him for as long as he did, he probably wouldn't have lasted. I, I think that's another good observation. Yeah, I think, yeah, like you said, they were pretty average there. I think I even made a video right before 2018 saying the Buckley should have been sacked. And then mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, in true, a classic true footy fashion, um, that was rendered like redundant yeah. within <laughs> six months but um i think way. i think with that fear as well the other thing that sort of helped buckley get that protection is because damien hardwick was in the exact same situation a few years prior until he turned yeah. richmond around yeah. yeah but has buckley turned around collingwood to the extent hardwick turned around richmond no <laughs> yeah no well, definitely not to the same extent but yeah. i mean there were a few good years there yeah. and they have played finals three years in a row a grand final a prelim but if you look at the pre- the, the season form this year one and three is pretty bleak with one win yeah. coming against carlton um, I just like we talk about the, the exodus, but I've maintained I think this list is good. Oh, it yeah. still is. Like you know, Grundy's still young. Degoe, yeah. who I still is probably my favourite player to watch in the comp. Yeah, um, he's still a good player. Pendleby just is yeah. still Pendles side bottom, still side bottom. Mm. Taylor Adams, Taylor Adams, Darcy Moore, Darcy just about Moore. Their best they've, player. They've, yeah, they've got some elite talent in there, but. Maybe they just do need to freshen up, and mm. like it's not a crack at anyone, but sometimes when you just have had the same coach, changes the same as good as messages, holiday. Yeah, it's yeah. Sometimes you just do need that change. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Like if you're looking at um, if a team that has performed well in the past, the team is good enough, um, and you're looking at it thinking, well, maybe it's just a mindset and mentality and morale thing. Then yeah. that's where you look at the coach and go, hmm, is this the right mix? So yeah, I think the pressure's rightfully on. Um, and I think Collingwood are uh, a finals quality team. So I think yeah. that's probably the benchmark for Buckley this year. If yeah. They don't play finals. And this is probably the best injury run in a while. Like, yeah. I think their injury list is fairly yeah. good other than Taylor Adams now mm. being injured. Yeah. But yeah. they got, like, um, destroyed by injuries in 18 and 19, and 19 as well. So yeah. And obviously last year they still won a final. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Long story short, yeah, Buckley needs to... I think the that when the season... Uh, got put on hold after round one last year I think that's what really hurt Barkley because mm. pre-season they looked great against round the Don, Don yeah. star. I think they destroyed them by about 52, 50, points, 52 or points or something yeah. so if there was one team that probably did not want that um, season to be put on hold it was definitely the Pies mm. especially being a Victorian based team that loves yeah. having the lengthy run of games at the MCG that would have and a big yeah. crowd effect as well it, yeah. true yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was hard for all Victorian teams, but you're right. I think, um, yeah, I forgot round one. Collingwood did look like the absolute yeah. benchmark, and then yeah. round two they drew with Richmond after the yeah. restart, and it was like, whoa, that game was absolute trash. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, I think uh, I think we're all on the same page there. We'll move on to some uh, Discord questions. Um, this one's from Joe, and this one's relevant to this upcoming round. He wants. Uh, he points out that Brisbane play Essendon this week, yep. um, and not only is it twenty years since the two thousand and one Grand Final, yep. but uh, Danaher is obviously coming up against his old club in the Bombers. Yep. Who goes to Danaher, and how will Joe slash the Bombers handle this game? Yep. You go first, Lenny. If I was coaching the Bombers, I'd just tell them just ignore Joe because I yeah. reckon that might play on his mind more. Because you know when you see and you see guys that push and shove before a game, it sort of animates the player yeah. to play well. So I'd just. I just tell the boys, look, just pretend he's not out there. Don't talk to him. Just if he tries to talk to you, just talk to your teammate. Because mm. I reckon that would play on his mind more. Because it, it would almost be like, do they even care about me? Like, what, <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Um, who do I think will play on him? Oh, I'd play either Aaron Francis or Zerk Thatcher. Mm. The other one I was thinking purely because of the height similarities would have been Carl Hooker. Yeah. But I think Hooker's just too valuable forward for them. So. What about someone like Jordan Ridley? He's actually a little bit taller than I realised. He was he's listed at one ninety five, but I thought he was about one ninety two. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, very good player as well. But maybe, I think yeah, Ridley's maybe... more your third intercept, whereas sure, I think yeah. Francis and Zach Thatcher have been very good as lockdown yeah. defenders. Zach but... Thatcher certainly seems more like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think you'd probably play Zach Thatcher and just tell Francis and Ridley just to come across and help out. Mm. Yeah, that's probably a fair call. How do you see this game going, Busher? Uh, probably lean towards Brizzy. They've sort of had the struggles this year. They probably see this as a chance to really kickstart their season because it's sort of been 
stalling a bit so far this year. Like they've been unlucky. balancing the clutch between stalling and nah. starting <laughs> yeah. to go a manual driving reference, but no one will get these days. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you can drive um, a stick using an app, um, <laughs> but no, I. Yeah, it, this is an interesting clash for me because, yeah. on like generally speaking, you think Brisbane every day of the week, but um, just the form lines of the last yeah. few weeks, Essendon really lifting. Yeah. The win, the loss in Sydney was almost as impressive as a win over St Kilda because yeah. of how well Sydney have been travelling. Yeah. So um, Essendon will be rating themselves, and yeah. Brisbane equally will be hungry because yeah. I feel like they've less p- points on the table losing yeah. in Ge- uh, down in Geelong, yeah. and. Um, and obviously, I had a tough opponent in yeah. pretty much every game so far, uh, and then also having only played in Queensland in, yeah. uh, in round one. So, um, I think the Lions will get the job. I can say Lockie Neal finally getting off the chain this game as well because he's had a pretty slow start to the year. Yeah, I think there's probably I can't really see someone from Essendon really going with him as much. I think he can probably get off the chain a bit more. This yeah, week. and gee, my fantasy. I'm team hoping that for my fantasy team yeah, too. Yeah, oh boy, oh boy, that's he was my top draft pick in think draft he's league. Dropped like 130k yeah. or something, yeah. probably more than that now. So <laughs> yeah, that hurts. Um, okay, Larry the Lobster wants to ask a question about his beloved Eagles and my beloved Eagles. Uh, should West Coast do tackling drills every day until they learn how to stick a tackle? I think this is a partially facetious question, but uh, Bush, you and I live streamed the game. Um, fair to say the intensity of the Eagles in the second yeah. half was pretty down. Even the first half, because we're watching it sort of going, the Saints are in this, the Saints are in this, even though the Eagles had the shit hot start, had built the big lead early the whole time. Mm. We were both watching it going, yeah, the Saints are in this. Mm. I, uh, yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right. I think I think there still was a big drop-off from first half to the second half mm. in terms of... The, the Eagles the definitely league. got complacent. I will say. Yeah, it could be complacent, definitely, or it could be exhaustion or it could be everything. Like, mm. I, to me, like in the second half against Port, I thought the Eagles looked pretty tired. And sometimes yeah. when you, you know, you get a massive lead, you put the cue in the rack so you don't yeah. think anything of it. But they haven't run out games overly well this year. Yeah. So that's my major concern. But to, to answer the question more specifically, we're not a strong tackling team. We're actually quite a poor side yeah. in terms of the contested stakes. I think we did really well against Port in those in that regard but I think Port also didn't show up as well so it kind of inflates um, our performance a bit Uh, one thing I noticed as well Zach Langdon um, I was reading this morning he's his tackling numbers at GWS were really high like four or five tackles a game and he's only managed two a game since he's been playing full games in the two full games so it's very small sample size, but I do wonder if there's something structural with our game plan or, yeah. you know, the way they coach that, you know, tackling's not really encouraged. Yeah, well, I mean, because I looked at some stats and it's like Cripps averages two tackles, Tim Kelly, who's predominantly a mid that can go forward, averages 1.3, mm. Darling averages one, then Jermaine Jones and Oscar Allen averaged 0.8, mm. Petrocelli 0.7, Kennedy 0.5, Ryan 0.5. So it's sort of like, really, it's an effort over talent. Yeah, so zero point seven for Patch is shit. Yeah, saying he's a far small forward. But even Cripps, that number alarmed me a little bit. But to be fair to Cripps, I think he, I don't know specifics, but I think he was averaging very highly in terms of pressure acts. Yeah, which is a different thing. Yeah, com- but that, that's just like you're chasing, you're smothering. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, and I think he had seven tackles on the weekend. So it's not like he was mm. lazy. So I mean, sure. really, if I was just a forwards coach, I'd just be saying, boys. Mm. It's your effort. It's not your talent. Yeah, and that's how you're probably going to kill more teams if you're tackling really hard in that forward half. Agreed. And the intensity just wasn't there in the second half. Um, I do think it hurts, uh, and it's bigger than just one player. But Elliot Yo also is an absolute yeah. good ball tackling machine, yeah. and he's going to be think, out for a while. So I think Shuey also is a massive loss as well. Because yeah. against Port, it looked like you guys got a lot more zip through the midfield, mm-hmm. like you had more speed. Whereas the previous couple of weeks, you guys looked a bit stagnant in the mm. midfield just from the games I'd seen. And I think dropping, or not dropping Shuey, but uh, bringing Shuey out and then bringing in a tall in Waterman or like yeah. a kind of a tall. He's got a good running capacity, but he's not a midfielder. Yeah. I don't know if that... Well, we probably would have lost either way, but for a side that seemed to run out of legs in the second half, dropping yeah. a midfielder in hindsight was a, a, a dumb decision, I think. Yeah. So um, hopefully we see a bit of a shuffle this week. And I know a couple of the different. mids played well in the waffle. I know. Yeah, yeah I think Zane True had about 25. Brian Nains have had about 37. Yeah, so that's true. I think um, a couple of midfielders are putting their hands up. And yeah. look, now's the time for them to make their stamp on the game. Good you point. Know, if Yo out, Shuey out. Hearns out as well, which yeah. might open it up for Withered and or Foley this week yeah. as well. So, um, yeah, so a bit of youth into the into the Eagles 22 this year. 
Um, we'll, we'll move on to Larry the Lobster's next question, which is a Melbourne question. Yes. Um, and this one is a little bit more positive. So Melbourne are currently sitting 4-0. The next six rounds include Hawthorne, Richmond, North Melbourne, Sydney, Carlton and Adelaide. Uh, and he says that they could potentially be 8-2 at this point. So yeah. do you think their season will fizzle in typical Melbourne fashion? Or do you think this is the year they are finally playing consistent footy? I'll, I'll let you answer this first, Bush, if you like. I'll say we sort of saw the teasing of it a couple of years ago, like where they were really young, got to that prelim final. They've mm. sort of had a bit of reality set in. They've sort of probably gained some perspective from it and they sort of seem to be coming through the other side. But they're starting to look like that team that they were in 2018 again. But this time when it pans out it could be better for them now that they've faced the adversity of 19 and 20 they've built on that mm. but they've still got what they had in 18 so now they can make it something even better yeah oh I think they're um, I think they're absolutely ready to give the finals a red hot crack um I think Mark Williams has been their biggest recruit off the field. Mm. He's their senior assistant coach. Is this his first year there? Or yeah, second? Yeah, first he year is. Right. Um, mm. And you just look at what he's done. He's a premiership coach. He's yeah. a good sounding board for um, some good win. And to be honest, for a lot of those clubs that are in the 6th to, say, 10th, 11th, I, I'd honestly just encourage them to try and find an ex-coach just to be a sounding board for the modern-day coach because... There is so much pressure on a senior AFL coach that if you've had someone who's been there already, doesn't want to be the full-time coach, but it's just there for sound advice and can mentor players, I certainly would. Uh, like, with that point quickly, like, because I remember last year, like, there was the suggestion of Wusher taking on a sort of role like that with JL at Dockers. Yeah. Like, that sort of idea wasn't too big on, but now that we've sort of seen the way it's gone, I, oh. I like that idea even more now. Oh, I was... I'm, I was I'm balls deep in that idea. <laughs> I was full reps for that when it first came out. I said, yeah. why wouldn't you? Like, yeah. he's a great sounding board. He doesn't have to coach, but he, he can just Director watch... Director of coaching. Yeah, or he can just it. watch what JL is doing. He can mm. watch what, you know, the other assistant coaches are doing. Likewise, if he went to West Coast, you know, he could be a sounding board for Simpson and sure. the other coaches there. Um, just something that's interesting for Melbourne is they've allowed the second fewest points in the AFL, and they're actually scoring really well, despite missing mm. Ben Brown and Sam Wiedemann, their two key so they're probably just going to be getting even better because I think I know they're missing May for the next two or three weeks with that horrific I eye heard injury. Four, but four, yeah, I heard yeah, okay, seven, no. okay, four. Yeah. Um, so look, ah, oh, they're great. I think they've got the most valuable player in the competition in Petrarca. Mm, they're cool. Um, and look, I think it's not. I think it's not this round. I think it's next round. But I'd when it's Melbourne versus Richmond, I just want to see Petrarca take mm. on Dusty. Yeah, bit like yeah. Dangerfield versus Fife in 2015, was it Bush? Yeah, that sort of ballpark. Yeah. yeah, when the two of them just played on each other. Cause, yeah, oh, right. yeah, was that when he was still at Adelaide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah that was a cracking game. Yeah, because right now I think Petrarch is. It's a big call, but I think he's overtaken the mantle as the most valuable player. Wow, that's it. That is a big call. Very like big it. call. Um, he's a fantastic and, player to watch. And saying that when it's September, I think Dusty might yeah. have him. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. Um, yeah, uh, re- all really good points. I think I, I do like to play devil's advocate with yeah. um, with their anything, but um, just with Melbourne. So they are four and zero. Yeah, and playing some really good footy. The teams they've beaten on paper sound good, but also haven't been the biggest challenges in the league yet. So they beat Fremantle by yeah. four goals. They beat a St Kilda when they were down. They beat GWS, who have been really up and down, yeah. uh, and then a Geelong side who's been very mediocre in my yeah. opinion so far. Oh, yep. However. Yeah, you have to make the case for Melbourne. Every team, virtually other than a couple of others, have dropped games they shouldn't have yet yeah. already. And yeah. Melbourne haven't done that. Yeah. And that is a huge positive. Oh, Especially yeah. when you look at the next six weeks. Yeah. Like you said, uh, like we said, sorry, it could be 8-2. and, two, and yeah. Not too many teams miss the finals from 8-2. and two. It does yeah. happen. But, yeah. um, but like Melbourne have the personnel. Like they, yeah. they are good enough. Defensively, like you said, really sound. It will hurt to have no May for the next four weeks yeah. um, or whatever it is. And um, but I think the other avenues to goal that they found have yeah. been really promising. So I think Petrarch is pretty high in their goal kicking. Yeah. Bailey Fritch is a player I really like enjoy watching. He's really classy, really um, really uh, a strong goal threat. And then yeah. obviously Cosy Pickett yeah, yeah. Um, bagged like eight goals or whatever this year, including a four goal hole. Yeah. So Tony when, McDonald's found some form again. Yes, true. Yep, yeah, exactly right. And then you add in Ben Brown who. Sean was much maligned last year, but prior to that has an incredible goal-kicking record. Yeah. And everyone's talking about how key forwards are now back in vogue. Yeah. And I think the new rules have set up someone like a Ben Brown to, yeah. to play well. Yeah. So, yeah, it just adds another dimension to a very strong team. So uh, they are looking very good. Yep. Certainly. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, cool. So we'll, we'll move on to Hawthorne now, who we have a couple of questions about them. So Javka9, first of all, asks, uh, has CJ... Uh, I st- I'm reluctant to say his name because I butcher it. GF? Ch- Ch- it's GF, the surname, yeah. but Chankus? It's, it, it's a lot yeah. better, better yeah. than what I would have said. <laughs> yeah. Um, has he established himself as the next big thing, will he make all Australian? I guess we should probably qualify what is the next big, big thing exactly. That's a very big call if it, you're going to say. Well, what does yeah. the next big thing mean? Does yeah. it mean the next like elite goat or does it mean... Um, does it mean he's going to be a good player? So, yeah. what are your thoughts so far on CJ? Um, oh, he's been probably the most exciting player. Mm. Um, I think in the preseason potty, I think I said I couldn't see Hawthorne having a real point of difference in their team, mm. and he's certainly become that. Um, well, I think he's the next big thing at Hawthorne. Sure. Not in the league, but at Hawthorne yeah. because he's their real point of difference, along with Jarman Impey. Um, Look, he's probably pushing for the 40-man All-Australian squad, but, you know, there's a lot of good small general defenders like Caleb exactly. Daniel, Brody Smith, Jack Lloyd, Jordan Dawson, Short, Baker, Stewart. So it's hard. Look, he, if he was named in the 40-man All-Australian squad, I wouldn't be surprised, mm. but there's got there's a lot of good and consistent small defenders. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think you summed it up perfectly. He's... Uh yeah, I don't think I've watched a Hawthorne game yet where I haven't gone, oh, yeah, he's playing well. So um, that's usually good on the eye test. He's, yeah. he's, he's playing really well. So uh, he's at 24 disposals a game, eight and a half marks. So I think yeah. he's third in total marks on fourth for, per game because I think yeah. Hawley's had one game and had 11 marks. So, yeah. uh, But seventh in total intercepts as well. So yeah. he's been a really big find in a year where Sicily's going to be unavailable. Yeah. Um, so they needed uh, you know another rebounding sort of defender and uh, he's kind of stepped up really yeah. well as well. Um, his running carry is pretty elite and uh, probably one of the best things going for Hawthorne in a year yeah. where um, they want to get games into the youth and someone like a Will Day who yeah. I, I really enjoy as a player is listed indefinite on the injury list yeah. so um, yeah a bit of a bright spot but I think 40 man all Australians realistic I yeah. think that's realistic yeah, yeah. Um, we'll move on to another Hawthorne question from Dominic who says uh, Kane Corns has suggested the Hawks barely have any under 25 A grade talent yeah he then compared Jager Romero to Jared Polek and labelled him a genuine B grader, even though he's a top two clearance mid, averaging 30 touches. Where do you see, see the Hawks going with the, uh, with the list and the young core? How long until they are in contention for the eight and eventually the flag? So I'll just unpack that because there was a lot going on there. Yep. Um, first of all, we can maybe address Jager Romero. Yep. Bushel, what do you think of Jager Romero as a player? I hadn't s- realised he's back up in form. Of getting f- any- I didn't realise he was anywhere near 30 touches mm. these days. I thought he was just sort of, since he's come back from his injury run, just sort of been a bit of a shell of himself. Sort of Still a very good player, but not like the transcendent player everyone thought he was. Sure. See, that, that, I think that's... F- I think Jared Pollock's a decent player as well. Yeah. Right? But yeah, I guess Dom's but a very But prior to his run, Jay Romero, like back in his Gold Coast first prime, everyone yeah. saw him as this transcendent next up player. He was the next type. Dusty, I yeah. think they were saying, or mm-hmm. next yeah, Job. Sort of, yeah, one of those sort of elite top tier dudes. Well, yeah, well, he had elite speed and explosiveness yeah. and um, in terms of, yeah, raw talent, Jay yeah. Romero was yeah. probably one of the best things um, along with Stephen Cornelio, perhaps even ranked higher than Stephen Cornelio. He was with the Jesse Hogan and Jack Martin yeah. sort of level. Yeah, because um, it was a mini draft. I mean, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but I think I think a B grade is probably about right to be honest. Yeah, like, um, I just don't think he's good. I, I think he's a B plus. High. Like, yeah, I think it's what you're saying. Like, he doesn't have the skills of like a Dusty who mm. can bullet pass it. But and like, mm. likewise, he's a bit of an accumulator. He's not exactly. a real damaging midfielder. Um, but look, and sometimes it's not bad just to be known as a B plus AFL player. I mean, mm. I'd take that in a heartbeat like that. Yeah, yeah I'd yeah. take being a D plus AFL player <laughs> in a heartbeat. Well, I mean, Dom Sheed was second in clearances before this round as well. Yeah. And, and if you said B grader, I'd be like, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Good player. But yeah. Um, yeah. But Remember, when, not every player can be an A grade player in yeah. AFL. It's, yeah. It sounds harsh, but it's not a participation league. Mm. So. Yeah, <laughs> take that, Dominic. <laughs> no, no, um, I, I think that's a fair analysis. But um, I guess maybe more broadly about Hawthorne, um, yeah. how do you see their list, particularly their under-25 talent? They're a team, as everyone knows, yeah. tried to sort of subvert a, a rebuild by trading yeah. in some elite players. And now, at the like with the bottom four finish last year, uh, they're thinking, shit, what do we do with the list now? Yeah. So where, where do you see them? Uh, I'm concerned for them mm. um, because they're either really old mm. or they're ridiculously young. They yeah. d- 
It's like apart from Mitchell and um, O'Meara. Wing they're, guard's they're probably in that category. They don't really Wing guard's have, probably in that same yeah, age bracket. They don't really have many of that, like 25 to 28, 29 players. Yeah. It's, they're out of 30 or they're ridiculously young. But <coughs> look, they've got some talented boys uh, in the under 25. You know, I think Harry Morris, Morrison looks pretty good. Yep. Mitch Lewis keeps developing. Warpool's already one of best and fairest. Um, Will Day's pretty good. Yeah, I like Will Day. CJ. Yeah. CJ is good. Yeah. Scrimshaw's good off half back. Blake Hardwick, I think, has been a very good role player for them. I didn't realise Tommy Phillips is only 24. Is he really? Yeah, he's That only... does fascinate me. Yeah. I would have said like 27. Yeah, he's only 24. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Um, he's yet to see Granger Barras, who I thought yeah. would have gotten the game. And yeah. I think Tyler Brockman's been the find of the draft so far. I think he went <laughs> pick 46. and Yeah. He's shown that he could have been a top oh, first round. Yeah. Where he's playing. I agree with that. I think they, they do have a weird, weirdly proportioned list. Like, their yeah. midfield is established. So, you've got Tom Mitchell, who's 28 this year. O'Meara's 27 this year. Wingard's 28 this year. Uh, Warple's a bit younger. Yeah. Um, and Impia. McAvoy's 31 and Segler's yeah. 30, so they're probably going to need to find a new yeah. Ruckman coming through the ranks. That's true. So, like, in terms of the demographic of the midfield, that's a team that's contending. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's around, it's the pieces around that, that I'm not yeah. convinced around. And the depth. Yeah, and also, yeah, the depth for sure. And But, um, you know, going forward, like, the keys, the key position situation doesn't fill me with confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Granger Brass, elite talent. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's he's a the tick. exception. Yeah. That's a tick, for but sure. He, but he's still 18. So, yeah, so exactly. he's, not, he's not like that 23. He's got the pre-seasons under him. He's strong, yeah. he's powerful. Yeah. Yes, uh, agreed. Um, they have some good, like, medium-sized players. Uh, uh, Sicily's great. Yeah. She has good. Um, and then forward, Gunston and Bruce are pretty old, even yeah. though amazing both players. 30, I think. So yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, if you tell me the the two key forward great hopes at the f- or three are uh, Mitch Lewis, Kaczynski, yeah. and Jonathan Patton, I'm thinking mm-hmm. if you compare that to some of the other young rebuilding lists around the league, yeah. um, may, other than maybe North Melbourne, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it doesn't stack up well. So yeah. I, I'm concerned going forward. That being said, we do have to have faith in Clarkson because. Yeah. I believe still play, play, uh, players will want to play for him. Yeah. And I think they're probably going to continue trading. Mm. And I think there was, there's always going to be the attraction of playing for Clarkson at Hawthorne. Um, maybe in a few years, a, yeah. uh, a Ben King or something yeah. silly like, comes, comes home. And I think that could change things. And that's, yeah. that's the nature of the, the modern list management sort of yeah. landscape. Things yeah. can change very quickly with a few yeah. trades. Um, it's fine. Like, I get the Clarkson, but... Are they thinking of bringing Sam Mitchell in as the head coach? Because yeah. he's been, I think he's the Box Hill coach. Yeah, head of Box Hill. Yeah, yeah. Head of Box Hill. And, you know, you saw what he did at West Coast in 2018. Mm. He mm. made them a very powerful midfield. So it wouldn't surprise me if in a couple of years' time it's Clarkson out, Sam Mitchell in. And Yep. Well, I mean, if I'm a player, I still think personally I would love to play for Sam Mitchell at yeah. Hawthorne. I just I think that's the, the reputation and yeah. the, the sort of... Um, cachet that he holds yeah. in the league um, as yeah. a potentially like bit of a footy genius. And the thing so. is with like Sam Mitchell in that position as well, you'd still say the benefits of someone like Clark who was his coach for his yeah. pretty much whole career, but then you'd sort of go, yeah, Sam Mitchell sort of sees the game a bit more modern. Perhaps you might see yeah. the stuff mm. that Clark was sort of starting to I think the, wane the thing, in. I think the thing that's killing Hawthorne now is they haven't actually gone we're rebuilding. They're, yeah. they're still kind of going, we want to play finals. Mm. And sometimes, I think I've said before, that can just be the worst thing when you're saying we are aiming to play finals when your list actually isn't that good. Mm. So in a lot of ways, like, yes, North Melbourne is struggling a lot and I get that, but at least they've actually gone, right, we're rebuilding. And that way, even the fans know, okay, we're, it's going to be tough, but we're rebuilding. Whereas mm. the worst thing is, oh, we're going to play finals and then you're losing every game. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. With Hawthorne, before we move on. Yeah. How long before they'll be in contention for you know finals and potentially a flag? Do you have, in terms of their list projecting it? It's hard to give it a timeline, I think, because they don't have enough youth where you can sort of project how it plays out. Yeah, like you can project how the kids they've got play out, but then there's still probably like eight mm. spots on the list at mm. least that you're sort of trying to project yeah. into the future, but you can't. I'd say at least three. Yeah, at least three, um, and that's being generous until like yeah, okay. you know they start getting you know the um drafts right which they've been good in the past but you mm. know when you haven't had that amount of first round talent come through the door yeah it's hard 
Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, uh, yeah, they've only had one real draft where they've yeah. really had a crack at it, um, and the rest of this have been trade. It's, it's going to be weird if, if Mitchell and Mira and Wingard move on, players they invested fairly heavily in terms yeah. of trades. If they move on before their window opens, like, yeah. you can only say they've kind of butchered that. Mm. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, like I said, things change quickly. Yeah. They could trade in a couple of elite yeah. key forwards and backs, yeah. and, and it looks different in a couple of years. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit iffy. Um, all right. Palumi asks, why do Carlton, Collingwood, Essendon and Geelong have more minor premierships than premierships? Yeah. Who would like to have a crack at this one? <laughs> I'll say it seems a bit of a bloody, uh, yeah, I know. guess, because they happen to do, perform better in the regular season than they do in finals. Mm. Mm. You could say that. Maybe they just ran out of legs. They used up yeah. all their energy during the home and away season. They Even the exactly. Dockers fall on that list. Yeah. One minor premiership, no premiership. Very it's unfortunate true. for us. I mean, the thing is with these four clubs, they're all really old clubs. And we're, yeah. we're talking about football for over the last 150 mm. years or something yeah. like that. So, I mean, a lot of those stats are probably coming from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, so, I don't know if yeah. there's like much to look into. I think these days now, it's undisputable or indisputable? Well, yeah. either. Yeah. One of those. Yeah, one of those. Um, that you know, winning the minor premiership often results in you not winning the flag. I yeah. mean, what has happened once in the last decade, I think? I'm just conjuring that. Like, Collingwood did it in 2010, Hawthorne did it in 2013. Yeah. I think that's it, though. Yeah, I think that's it. So, what we're seeing is um, it's not that critical. So, yeah. and with teams like Richmond clearly don't, like, their, their motive, or their, their priority, it appears, and from what I've read, is to get right for finals rather yeah. than gun for top spot because yeah. the only year they came top they butchered it in yeah. the final. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, arguably it's it's worse to... If you win a minor premiership these days, it's almost like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to win the flag. No, yeah. not really. But, I mean, um, I don't think there's a massive importance on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I couldn't answer why, but maybe in a, in a modern context, Geelong, for instance, who are a team who finished minor yeah. premiers in 2019? Did they? The, no. Recently, yeah. They did, didn't no, they? Recently. 20. No, no 20 Port was last year. Port, yeah. Port was 19. last year, weren't they? Yeah, Port was last year. Yeah, Geelong yeah, finished. It might have been 19, yeah. Yeah, they did. They finished yeah. up. So, um, but again, uh, didn't make the grand final. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe they think about it differently about the way they sort of, their strength and conditioning programs over the course of the year. I don't know, maybe I'm looking too far into it, yeah. but um, yeah. So, anyway, um, we'll move on to, uh, this is a question I just saw on Instagram. Um, and I don't know, it's probably not actually being talked about seriously in the AFL like circles. No. I was um, just floated by Demo because he wanted to get one of his young Ruckman a game. <laughs> was Demo asked about it or did he bring it up? He brought it up because he was saying he had this young Samson Ruckman kid on his list. He said he'd oh, be yeah. happy to loan him out to Gold Coast so he can get some games under him. Sure. That's so basically the premise. We're talking about a, an AFL loan system. So if for those who don't watch uh, the Premier League in particular, well, I mean just soccer in general, yeah. um, you can... You can loan players for the duration of their contract or for like a one-year loan. Um, they can go to... It's often another league, but they can go play for another team for a year, yeah. develop, and compete at, frankly, a different level. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on this happening in the AFL? So, for instance, uh, young Heath Chapman can't get a game at Fremantle. Hypothetically, I know he's in the team, but it's just an yeah. example. Yeah. Gets a, uh, a one-year uh, loan to um, Hawthorne to help out yeah. with their defensive issues whatever um what are your thoughts on this lenny love it yeah i think it's great you know it allows probably more kids to be given a crack and especially those kids that are in the right place at the wrong time you know like if you're an 18 year old kid and you've just come into richmond now you're unlikely to get a game Mm. um purely just because of how strong richmond is so yeah i think the more games you can get into kids and um the better it is for the league and for your club I mm-hmm. think it's particularly important because there's no resis competition. If there's a resis competition, it wouldn't be necessary. But the fact there isn't like an AFL tier resis competition where yeah. these reserves players that can't crack their teams get an opportunity to practice against other professionals, not yeah. Joe the plumber who happens to play waffle or whatever. No offense to waffle players, but yeah. mm. you know what I mean. But like they sort of get the chance to press that stand against fellow professionals. Yeah. Whereas with the loan system with no resis, they can yeah. get a crack at AFL level football. Yeah. And it would help out clubs. So, for instance, Gold Coast, which now, well, I think they've lost their heart and soul on their team in wits. So, yeah, it's very hard to replace them. But say, for instance, Richmond, they've got a boy called Ben Miller. Um, you know, if they loaned him up there, he's a 
ruck forward or forward ruck and then you know you get more game time into him and you can actually see how he goes at that was the exact sort of thing Dimmer was preaching when the idea first came up about the line system because he Mm -hmm. sort of brought that up pretty much that exact example when Wits went down he said we've got some young ruckmen we'd love to get games into we'd be happy to send them up there Mm -hmm. was pretty much how Dimmer put it I've I've been thinking of some ways it won't work and to compare it to uh, football or soccer, yeah. rather. Yeah, um, yeah it's the, soccer here, mate. Don't well, call it football. Sorry. Why? Why it? Uh, why it works there? I think is that you can send them to different leagues. Yeah. I think that's a bit of an obstacle, or it's it's a concern. I think. Yeah. Um, there's a few reasons. So if you're loaning back a young player, say to Victoria. Yeah. Um, what if they start to like Victoria? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I suppose that's always your right, your prerogative to be like, nah, we won't do this loan. I just think it will make retention hard. I think it'll be hard to build, uh, maintain a culture as well. And I think as well, when, when you've got 18 teams competitive with each other, the the IP, like the, yeah. the intellectual property, so yeah. going to, say, spend a year at Richmond and then coming back to West Coast, yeah. Yeah. like Richmond's, you're going to know Richmond's game plan pretty in well, depth and, yeah. and their weaknesses and exploiting that. So I think, I think there's going to be issues with that. There's yeah. reasons why that it won't work. Um, as well, one thing I would, I kind of like um, the idea that we have a trade period within the confines of this little period and then at the start of the season, the list that you've compiled is the list you go with. Yeah. So I, that's why I don't particularly like the mid-season trade yeah. and equally with a loan system. So what yeah. I would hate to see is say, um, yeah, so like uh, Nan Curvis goes down for Richmond um, yeah. and they got no ruck or whatever yeah. and then um, they go down to say a Gold Coast and be like, hey, you're not... You're, uh, you don't need Jared Witts because you guys are going to come bottom six. Uh, yeah. What if we do a loan for him? Do yeah. you know what I mean? And then Jared Witts is instrumental in a Richmond flag yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So I, I don't like the idea of that. I like the strategy around compiling a list for that year. Yeah. And then it's up to you to build depth in each position. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that's the arguments against it. I it, don't mind a mid-season trade, but... Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, the, the issue with that for me is like... Like the buy rounds, you'd like leave a free week window during the buy rounds where you sure. can sort of do something if you've copped a couple of injuries or whatever. Like what, beyond what, that, it'd be a bit. What I don't like is a player like moving on a player. I think you'd have to almost make it the players to be twenty one or under. Yeah. In a way, because otherwise, like it could be what you're saying, mm. like, oh, North Melbourne, you're not playing finals, but we need a yeah. four and a half spark, Stevenson. Exactly. How about that? Yeah, then, yeah, Stevenson come for even if even if it was a trade like yeah. trading like a gun player for to a team that's rebuilding and be like, hey, we're actually in the top four, so we'll give you our first round if we can have, um, I don't know who's a who's a decent if you're Jay Romero. Yeah. If we can have Jay Romero for um, even if it's a trade or a loan, yeah. whatever, yeah. and then that player is helps the team contend for a flag. Yeah. That's I don't like that in AFL yeah. personally. Yeah. But, I'm just more used to it in the other sports I follow, yeah. so I can live yeah. with it. I guess. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think of all that because I think that is actually a pretty good debate because um, it's probably something that we're going to move to eventually. Yeah, I think same. it's the fact that it's already been talked about. When things get talked about for a few years, they eventually I happen. I think one issue with all this freedom of movement stuff, like the issue we've discussed repeatedly on here is like the players ultimately can say, nope, I'm not going there. Mm. Like you need that capacity to send, say, play, nope, fuck you, we're sending you to Gold Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever get that personally, but uh, yeah, you're right. Um couple of questions from bruce as we uh, round out this podcast guys um it's a he's a Fremantle fan so it's a, it's a wa based one so uh this is actually probably a good one for lenny to sort of take over as a uh, yep. doctor of drafts <laughs> um draft bruce, daddy bruce asks who are the best wa talents in this year's draft um do the eagles and dockers have any promising academy or father son players coming through so what yep. are your observations lenny um so there's matthew johnson at subi Jacob Van Brooyen at Claremont, Jack Williams at East Fair, and Rep Bazo at Swan Districts, who are in the AIS squad or the Australian under 19s team, mm-hmm. under 18s team. Um, other boys to watch are Josh Brown, Kay Dipmar, Jesse Motlop, who's in Fair's Academy, and he's the son of. I want to Daniel? Say, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Does that mean he's father son for North? Because didn't Daniel Motlop play for a lot of games for North? I think he. I think he missed just the eligibility. Oh, really? Just, yeah, so. So there was one. Yeah, he could have been up for three teams or something, but he missed just the games somewhere. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Neil Erasmus at Subi and Maxi Chipper at Swan Districts. Um, an interesting father son at the moment is Kobe Farmer, who is Jeff oh. Farmer's kid. Wow. Who trained with Melbourne over the preseason. So yeah. 
Look, he could go in the mid-season draft. Is uh, he WA based? Yeah, he's a uh, Swan Districts boy, I believe. So not eligible for Fremantle. Didn't play enough games. Jeff Farmers. Um, I think he's more eligible to go to Melbourne than right. he is Fremantle. Yeah, okay, I gotcha. think so. Yeah, right. So yeah, they're probably the main ones who I'd be looking at. Um, and if I had to take one pick of the WA boy who's going to go first out of the WA boys, not number one in the whole draft, but one for WA, it would be Matthew Johnson at Subi. Mm, I was going to uh, mention him specifically because he's like the one name I know. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a big body midfielder. He plays a bit like Elliot Yo. Nice. Uh, he's, got, he's powerful. He's strong. He's got a bit of skill. He's been training with Subiaka's league team. So, yeah, they've got high hopes for him. That sounds exactly like the player the Eagles need, another yeah. young midfielder. And we have to keep our first rounder this year. Yeah. Um, so hopefully he's around the yeah. 10 range, not too yeah. high. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully he uh, just has a um, off-field indiscretion. He slips yeah. down like <laughs> Jeff Darling special. Yeah, exactly. Or, um, or just gets Peter Simmons to come out and just yeah, go. His attitude's sort. terrible. Yeah. Exactly right, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, Bruce also wants to know... Uh, he lists three players, and I, I feel like he's asked this question before, but he's mixed it up a little bit now. But Caleb Sarong, Andrew Brayshaw, Oscar Allen. Yeah. Who is the who will be the best player and why out of these three? So, uh, Bush, do you have an opinion? It hurts me to say this, but Oscar Allen. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yep. He's why, just like because of the way he's like he's a tall talent. Like he's Pavlich all over him. Like can play him in the midfield, can play him back, can play him forward. Mm. Like it has the ability to be an all Australian in any of those lines, like Pav. He's basically that sort of player, even already at twenty one and, and as a tall he's still got so much room to develop. Yeah. Whereas as great as Brayshaw and Sarong are midfielders are a bit more dime a dozen compared to Oscar Allen type yeah. talents. Who do you prefer out of Brayshaw and Sarong in terms of ceiling? Ooh Sarong. Yeah? Yeah, I'm I'm into Sarong bandwagon. No, I think yeah. he's more damaging by foot. Sure. Um, and he's also got the leadership qualities. And saying that though, Brayshaw's <laughs> leadership qualities are pretty schmick. Yeah. And saying that though, Brayshaw, gee, he can win a hard ball. Mm-hmm. Look, once he learns to deal with the tag, I think he'll become an even better player. But right now, I'd go number one, Oscar Allen. Number two, Sarong. Why, why Oscar Allen? Um, basically, for the same reasons that Bush said, you know, sure. he could win All Australian at centre half back, he could win All Australian at full forward he could play in the midfield plays in the ruck mm. um, and I think he's really only just scratching um, the surface of his potential yeah. yeah like his skills and stuff can still get like sharper like he's kicking and all that yeah. sort of stuff but it's still like I'm not saying it's bad but like it could get even better yeah like well, it could go from 100 to 200% <laughs> 200% nah. kicking uh, yeah I love these three players to be honest I think I think uh, the world of them I think they're all really really good talents so um I'm glad I answered last because I, I am tempted to say Oscar Allen. And I think part of it is, as well as Fremantle fans, you guys are lacking a key forward at the moment. So you're like, yeah. fuck, it'd be good to have an Oscar Allen. And yeah. equally, I'm looking at Brayshaw and Sarong and be like, our midfield's trash. Can I have one of those, please? But yeah. I think... Trade! I just, yeah, Wait, nah. you don't like trades. Fuck you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, no, so I... I mean, I can understand why another club would want to trade any of these players. Uh, but I think the fact that he's just a key position, um, yeah. it's just... It's a harder talent to um to obtain, and I, I've said this a few times, but I think one of the best decisions the Eagles did make was not to draft Tim Kelly at twenty one in that yeah. draft because Oscar Allen would have probably been drafted to a Geelong, yeah. and I can still see Oscar Allen never leaving Geelong if he'd been yeah. there, and um and we still got Tim Kelly, so yeah. uh yeah no I I think the. The versatility, I think, is underrated because yeah. he's such a competitor. I think that's what sets Allen apart, uh, yeah. not from these boys, but in general across the league, what yeah. makes him such a good talent compared to someone like a Jared Brander, who we took eight yeah. picks before. He's just he's a competitive beast, yeah. and he wants to be the best, and he's got yeah. attitude, he's got, he's got leadership skills, uh, much like Brayshaw. Yeah. But, uh, but the fact that he's playing second ruck and then playing all these different positions for the Eagles from his second year to his fourth year, uh, I think he's... He's underlooked. I think he's starting to get recognition around the yeah, league. Yeah. But I think if he, you know, it's a WA cliche to say this, but if he played for a big club in Victoria, he'd get uh, more noticed. He'd be on the Dugowie levels of, yeah. of, of hype. So, yeah. um, but that being said, Brayshaw, you know, I can see him winning at Brownlow yeah. and he's possibly second or third on this list. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's the level of talent we're, we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Chera fan as well because yeah. I think yeah. Chera's along with Brayshaw yeah. are very good. Chera's talent. the most skilled of the four. Yeah. If you put Chera in that group as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Very classy. Um, okay, final question. Non-football related, but Bruce uh, Bruce wants to know our favourite WA or interstate holiday destination and why. So, uh, Busher, where's yours? 
I'll be a bit biased and say because I've pretty much grown up there, right? I've always just loved being around the island, cool. just getting out on the boat, that sort of stuff. But yeah. even some other spots in WA, there's, I've had some good spots up near Jury and some good spots in June's down there, down south, Pemby, that sort of area is all yeah. beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. What about yourself, Lenny? Oh, I'm going to have to go Melbourne. Got yeah, the family cool. over there. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah, got right. um, watching footy at the G Live, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at Marvel, even. It's brilliant. Good coffees over there. Good beers over there. <laughs> True. It's beautiful. Cheaper. Cheaper yeah. beers, that's for if sure. If I have to pick intrastate, like in WA, oh, look, I'm going to have to say Albany or Jarrow purely because I've got family in those two regions as well. And uh, if I said anywhere else, I'd probably get killed by them. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm going to list uh, the clearer choice here is Bunbury. Oh, <laughs> nah. I'm a, I'm a Bunbury boy. I don't know if I've really said that too much on this uh, on this show, but um, yeah, no, I'm a Bunbury boy. But the other thing is, I've also grown up overseas, and I've it will probably shock people how little of WA I've actually seen. <laughs> uh, I've gone to Bunbury and Bustleton. Uh, I played footy up in the Wheat Belt. Uh, I've never been to Geraldton. I've been to Albany once as a kid. Yeah. So yeah, not the great best guy to ask. I yeah. probably would say. Bustleton, Dunsborough yeah, area because yeah. I did spend a bit of time yeah. there. I'll give Warpole a quick shout out quickly because we got yeah. our family friend Remo down there. Nice. It's a good yeah. spot. Remo, how do you get that name? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I don't know how we got that name actually. Um, but I will emphatically agree with you and say if I could choose anywhere, uh, it'd be Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, for all the reasons you highlighted, um, I feel at home there. Yeah. Uh, I could definitely see myself living there. So. I, I, I like Melbourne to visit, not to live. I wouldn't live in Melbourne, but I'd love it. Like visit, I'd visit it all the time, but I wouldn't live there, I don't reckon. I would live there mostly for the career opportunities. If I'd I move there for a job, like, but I yeah. wouldn't yeah. Like, just move there just to move sure. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If I, I was mean, a man of leisure. Yeah, with a capital P. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, that probably wraps up the True Footy Podcast 73. Uh think we ran all right yeah, yeah. good Not length bad. yeah thank you it's just, <laughs> just the way i'm sitting actually so um lenny thank you so much for your time as no, always um, no worries thanks happy. for having me again yeah no worries man we're keen to have you on this show whenever you're available um yeah. and i know the the listeners and viewers uh, feel the same way so oh, thank you for your yeah. time busher thanks for nothing absolutely <laughs> i do what i can <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching guys make sure you subscribe if you're new and we'll see you somewhere on youtube cheers